Hey Victim, thanks so much for stopping back by. I'm Sarah and today I am talking about some phenomenal women in writing. So I was tagged by Uncommon Reader on the Phenomenal Women book tag. This book tag was created by Marilyn Maya Mendoza to celebrate her channel anniversary as well as her birthday in August. So happy birthday and thank you to Uncommon Reader for tagging me. There are three questions to this tag. The first question is who is your favorite phenomenal woman author? Now, the super obvious ones, if you guys have been watching very long, I love Jane Austen, I love Emily Bronte, but that does feel kind of like a pat answer to me. Um, so I was thinking about Agatha Christie because while Agatha Christie's, you know, her stories are great, I'm like, I'm not a super huge fan, but I did read four or five, I think, over the summer and they weren't bad. I love the Joan Hickson TV shows from the 80s of Agatha Christie fantastic. <laughs> but I, you know, the books are sort of mediocre and I think I'd probably enjoy more if I hadn't seen everything in TV. But anyway, getting off track. Um, I think Agatha Christie is phenomenal because of the life she lived. So as a young woman, she started writing. As a young woman, she started being published. She was married. She had a child. And as she was coming into fame, she ended up having some struggles in her marriage. Her husband was having an affair, it was pretty well known, and she ended up um, going missing for a little bit. So there's a whole, you know, thing of where was Agatha Christie for these seven to ten days or whatever, however long it was. Some people think maybe she lost her memory. Um, I think she kind of played that, you know, way that maybe she had lost her memory and didn't know how she ended up at this hotel and then suddenly regained her memory and her husband came to get her. And I think she was actually just like a very emotionally distraught woman who was grasping in desperation at the, you know, trying to get her husband to, um, stay with her. And if he didn't love her, then maybe he would stay out of guilt. And I think that she um, kind of staged her disappearance to kind of um, like get his attention and see, you know, how is he going to react? Is he going to freak out? Is he going to be glad? Like, how is he going to react? And so anyway, that was kind of, I think, a low point in her life and probably one of the lowest. But after that and after uh, her divorce, she went on to just pull herself up by her bootstraps. She ended up marrying someone quite a bit younger than her and he absolutely adored her. He was an archaeologist and would travel to other countries and um, do this amazing cool archaeology stuff and she got to come along and was well respected on his digs and you know during his different uh you know with his colleagues and things and she just had like a little writing like building that they made for her like her own little writing house writing shack thing um on the site and she could go in there and write her novels while they were doing archaeology and she got to spend all of her days with her doting husband doing what she loved while he did what he loved and clear through until her very elderly years when he wasn't so very elderly yet he still was you know caring for her and doting on her and just treating her like a queen a special queen and um, I just think that's so sweet, just the way her life ended up turning out great, even though, you know, her first husband just, you know, totally dogged on her. <laughs> it turned out well for her. And so I think that was really phenomenal. And I think that, um, you know, the great life that she was able to live allowed her to be very creative and uh, to produce tons of, you know, novels because she, you know, basically had a room of her own. I am going to make that Virginia Woolf video I keep talking about, but she kind of did, right? Wherever she was, she just kind of had that um, ability and, um, and it ended up turning out some great creative works. So I think that's pretty phenomenal. I think that, you know, that's something to be proud of um, that she came out of a yucky situation and and was able to um, turn things around and live a great life. So I think we'll choose Agatha for that prompt. 
All right, number two, what book features your favorite phenomenal woman character? Now, uh, I did say that one of my favorite phenomenal women is Emily Bronte. There is a book that I read last year or the year before called Emily's Ghost. It's by Denise Jardina, and this is such a fantastic book. <laughs> So it is a fictional story about the life of Emily Bronte. In this book, the author gives her a love interest. It is such a cool book. It is such a cool story. I love this book so much. I have felt a connection to Emily Bronte for a long time. About 10 years ago, I visited the parsonage at Haworth and got to see where the Brontes lived. You know, and I had been to the homes of Jane Austen. I had been to the home of Laurie Ingalls Wilder. Um you know, several author homes. I've been to Byron's estate. I have been to the homes of several different authors that, you know, that were well known or that I loved, but I was not ever affected the way that I was affected when I went to Haworth. Uh, something about it, I just cried. I, I just cried like these mournful, like regretful <laughs> tears for this family um, and for someone that I just never knew, but just felt very connected to. History kind of tells the story of Emily Bronte as being wild and vulnerable and raw. She's somebody that I connect with on a gut level, but would probably never actually have a conversation with in person. I think for me, I cover up a lot of that stuff with humor and I don't know, just... I'm not, I'm not very vulnerable, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think I'm very vulnerable about the really deep things. But she seems to be. I think it takes a really special person to write about the Brontes well, but especially uh, Emily. But I think that this author probably um, fills that same sort of gut connection because the way she wrote about Emily Bronte was absolutely phenomenal. It's exactly how I have always pictured her. It's exactly how I um, sort of, you know, think that she thought. She puts into words everything that I ever have seen Emily Bronte to be and that I think that I would be if I sort of had the freedom that Emily Bronte had. And that may sound like a contradiction when you look at, you know, the freedoms in societies that she did not have. But um, the way that she was raised and in the place that she lived, um, she had a lot of freedom of thought and a lot of freedom of time. And uh, those seasons are coming for me as my children grow and go their own direction. Um, but they are not yet here and haven't been a part of my life since I was very young. <laughs> this story is very, very likely not true. The author has her developing a romantic relationship with her father's sort of like curate in training. <laughs> and uh, and there's not really any evidence for that, I don't think, uh, for that man, uh, William Waitman, to have been her love. But reading this, um, it's just like, how could that not be true? It's just so well done. I also like how the author wrote Charlotte because I've never liked Charlotte. <laughs> And Charlotte does something very evil in this book, and um, it sort of vindicates all of my bad feelings that I've ever had about Charlotte. So, I don't know. Me and this author are on the same page for, in a lot of ways. <laughs> so, I guess the, there's two phenomenal women here. The character of Emily Bronte and the author, Denise Jardina. All right, and then the last question is, if you were creating a book prize, which book by a phenomenal woman author would you choose? So I actually am kind of tied for two. One is The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. This book is so fantastic. It is full of phenomenal women. Uh, Amy Tan is a phenomenal author herself. But The Joy Luck Club, it is just so fun and heartbreaking and irritating and great. It's just has every emotion in it. Um, the Joy Luck Club follows Chinese mothers and their daughters and tells um, perspectives on different snippets of their lives from the daughter's point of view and the mother's point of view. So the mothers are thinking back on their lives in China and um, 
trying to help their daughters understand some life lessons based on their experiences in China, but the daughters are American girls. And so they want to be American girls. They don't want to look back on China. They don't want to look back on their heritage. They want to, you know, do what the other American girls are doing. And they want to start a new way of life. And they want to start, and they want to let go of old ways and start new ways, which they think are better ways. And the mothers are trying to explain, you know, there, there might be good ways, but that doesn't mean our ways are, are wrong, bad, ancient, um, you know, unrelatable anymore, or, um, or just, you know, unimportant. It's just this wonderful look at how important it is for younger generations to value and respect what the older generations are bringing to the table. Um, it doesn't mean that those older generations are always going to be right in everything and their ways are always the best ways, but there is some wisdom there just with experience, just with life that I think um, the younger girls would be very wise to take into consideration, right? For myself, I'm kind of in this middle place, right? I'm not yet like the older person yet. Uh, that's sort of taken as a wise one, you know, in certain areas, in certain circles, maybe just in my own little small community group, some might look and say, oh, you've, you know, you've had children for the last 25 years, you've been homeschooling for 22 years, you must have some wisdom to share, like that, but not just generally like, wow, she's lived a long time, she probably knows a lot of stuff, right? I'm not there, but I'm also not in that season where I'm, um, where I need a lot of mentors and where I am sort of just finding my way, right? And, and, and sort of stepping out into adulthood and stepping out into society and those sorts of things. I'm not there either. So I'm just kind of in this little in-between place, <laughs> just sort of waiting to grow up completely, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I have read The Joy Luck Club several times throughout my life. And uh, I just read it a couple of years ago for the first time in probably 10 years or more. And it hit differently than it did when I was that younger girl in my 20s. So this, I think, is the only thing I've read by Amy Tan. I do have a couple of her books on my TBR. I just haven't got to them yet. And I think part of it is because I don't want anything to upstage the Joy Luck Club. <laughs> it's been one of my favorites for so long. So I don't know, I should probably pick it up. But the other author that I want to mention is Zora Neale Hurston, and she wrote Their Eyes Were Watching God, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, this book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, it is just one of the most beautiful books I have ever written. Just some of the most beautiful writing. Um, some of her quotes from that book, I just... It's really a treasure. In fact, when I read this a few years ago, I wrote that besides the Psalms, this was probably the most beautifully written piece of literature that I had ever read. Zora Neale Hurston published this in 1937. She was a African-American like folklore sort of type storyteller. She told a lot of stories about um, life in the South and in just that way that I was talking about the other day when I was talking about that book I was reading, The American Queen. Um, it's just that lyrical prose that I love, that I feel like just only a Black woman can do. <laughs> That's just so beautiful. I love it. Her biography is pretty cool, and uh, and I won't go into it all here, but anyway, she was a pretty phenomenal woman and did some pretty phenomenal things, and uh, her book their Eyes Were Watching God just is a beautiful story about Janie Crawford, and she is just going to go out and do her thing. <laughs> She's in kind of like an identity journey, um, and, and I won't spoil it for you guys, but some of the quotes from this book just really grip me. One of them specifically is, there are years that ask questions, and there are years that answer. I read this almost to the day one year before my father passed away. And of course, we had no idea when he got sick. It was very sudden and he, he died less than two weeks from, you know, getting sick. And so uh, it was really a, a big shock. But I can remember writing that quote down. There are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. And thinking to myself, 
what kind of things are coming my way? You know, what kind of uh, questions am I going to encounter in this next little bit of my life? And how long will it take for them to be answered? How long will it take for them to be resolved? Um, and it just, I just remember how much it struck me when I read that. And then um, almost a year later, going through the loss of my dad, and then all of the changes that happened just in my own household with children moving out, children getting married, having children, um, you know, my identity changing, becoming a grandma and a mother-in-law and, you know, a half orphan with losing my dad and all these different things, right? There's just been a lot of years of questions. And so uh, those answers come. <laughs> some of those answers have kind of partially come and some are still just out there floating around. And I don't know, just it's just one of those thoughts that was just so profound and simple at the same time and just beautiful. And then another one, and I am just going to say it as if I would say it because it's written as if this character would say it. And I, I don't want to botch or mock the way that this African American woman would have said this, but basically the quote is this, love is like the sea. It's a moving thing, but still and all, it takes its shape from the shore it meets, and it's different with every shore. And, ah, I just thought that was so beautiful, you know? Like, like I can look at my life right now, and I can, I'm 44 years old, I'm, I'll be 45 next month, and all of the things that have happened, and all of the ways in which I've loved, and all the people I've loved, and all of the different kinds of love that has, you know, that I have felt, right? My love for my husband is different than my love for my children, which is different than the love for my mother, which is different than the love for my dad, which is different than the love for my best friend, which is different than the love for the guy I passed in the park. I can remember last year, last winter, I passed this guy and he's probably like maybe 60 if that and he had like an ice cream cone in his hand and then he had like his dog on a leash and it was um at christmas time and so the the whole park was full of christmas lights it was at night time and it was just like you know there's lots of people milling around because everybody's there to see the lights and just kind of hang out on the on the town square and this guy's just walking along and being happy and i get i can just like i remember feeling so much love for this random man you know just because he was having such a great night. You could tell he's like, he's got his ice cream cone. He's got his dog. We live in the South. Like we have ice cream in December <laughs> outside anyway. And I was just, my love for this person just bubbled up. And I was like, that's so great. I, I don't know. I just, he has stuck in my head, this random person. Anyway, right. All those different kinds of love that we feel for people um, it changes as we bump into them, right? As we hit that shore and it comes back and it's a different kind of love. And, and so love moves and it morphs and it changes. And, um, and even the love that we have for someone who's been in our life for a really long time, right? The love that I feel for my husband now, as opposed to the love I felt for him when we were in high school at 16, totally different, right? And, and the love that, I'll feel for him 30 years from now when we are, you know, moving into a more elderly stage of life. Uh, it'll be different than I feel now, right? So, ah, uh, beautiful. If you, if you guys haven't read that, look for Their Eyes Were Watching God. All right, for three questions, I've made this video super long, uh, but it's been fun. So, hope everybody enjoyed that too, and uh, have a great night, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.